like, I don't have a fancy intro. We're just going to go into the word. Is that OK? All right, cool. Thank you. Um, that makes my time here a little bit easier. All right. So we're, we're in Mark chapter 2, uh, verses 13 to 17. All right. We're going to focus on these five verses, and we're going to pack some stuff from it today. All right. So here we go. Chapter 2, Mark, verse 13. Once again, Jesus went outside, or went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and, we, and he began to teach them. As he, was, as he walked along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So in order to prepare for, like, today and this message and this topic, I asked my wife, um, Rayanne, um, about the health care system. Okay, I, I felt like she was a good resource, and she was right there. Um, and she's been, you know, in the medical field for more than 10 years now, in the ICU, taking care of the sick. So my question was, like, like, what do you do? <laughs> like, what is your job? You know, like, explain it to this humble simpleton. And she kind of broke it down into like these three questions. And the three questions are simply this, is identify what needs to be treated, find out the patient history, and come up with their treatment plan. That's it. And that's like, or that's it. But you know, obviously, there's very a lot of details and nuances to this. And I'm totally dumbing it down. But that, those are the main things that like nurses and medical professionals do. And I thought, cool. I don't think this helps me much for, for, uh, for this message, but I thought it might be cool if we, since, since we are talking about the topic of like sickness and, 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 and whatnot, I thought it would be interesting to apply these three questions to unpack this text, because there's definitely some type of sickness that Jesus is addressing. There's some kind of brokenness that Jesus is trying to restore here. So what is that, right? What's that all about? So. Let's first look at the verse that drives Jesus to respond the way that he does. Verse 16, when the Pharisees asked Jesus why he eats with tax collectors and sinners. Now, for those of you who need a little bit of a refresher, um, the Pharisees were like the most influential religious party of ancient first century Palestine. They believed that through like strict following of the Old, Old Testament laws and the traditions of their elders, that was the way to do God's will and to be a part of God's kingdom. And um, the, the system was so elaborate, so complex, so many layers to it, that literally, like, a majority of the people, most normal people, like, this, they were never going to be able to devote themselves in the way that the Pharisees did. Like, it was an impossible standard, so it really set the Pharisees apart. They were isolated, like, like literally set apart, relationally, structurally, all, like social systems-wise, they're set apart, isolated, elevated in some ways, right? And this led to them sincerely believing that they were the only true followers of God. Like, they were the only ones who were righteous. So with that history in mind, with that patient history in mind, these Pharisees come and ask this Jesus person, who's been teaching them about God, who, who's been teaching people, anybody, about God's kingdom to normal folk like a blue-collar fisherman like Simon or Andrew or a sinner hedge fund tax collector named Levi and totally jacks up their theology. And the religious system that elevated, like, in the religious system that elevated their status, their privilege, for a really long time, like, Jesus is kind of screwing it all up with his teaching. So naturally, the Pharisees are like, why? Why are you doing this? Why are you teaching this? This is screwing up our system. And with this particular case, Jesus answers their question with their answer. Like the Pharisees, a big part of what Pharisees did is they would have conversations about, theological conversations, 
and it'll, it'll always be like logical, like conversations and arguments and, and dialogues and whatnot. So every once in a while, they'll use like these common phrases of like, like kind of gotcha phrases. You like, if you see Mandalorian, for example, there's this one dude. I won't, I won't give it too much, but like give away too much. But oh no, oh no, oh no, not one dude. This is a better analogy. There's an like ongoing phrase in Mandalorian where, where they say, "This is the way," right? Anyone seen Mandalorian? They'll say, "Okay, if not, that's I'm sorry, but total geek here." Um, and so that's like one of the, like if someone says it, you're like, "Oh, okay, then I, I can't I can't I can't argue with that." That is the way. And so this is like kind of one of those phrases for the Pharisees, where they would say they'll get into this argument and they'll come to this phrase like because it makes perfect perfect logical sense for them. It was a valid accepted logical argument that the Pharisees used, which is. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And so Jesus turns Pharisees' teaching, and he flips it on them and brings it to their faces. But he adds this after, I have not, co I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And like that, that last sentence should, like, should like throw us for a loop. <laughs> um, because what Jesus is saying here is that there's a type of sickness, there's a type of sickness that Jesus is like, yeah, I'm here for that. Like, I'm the right doctor for that. But on the flip side, Jesus is also saying that there's a type of sickness where Jesus is saying like, I'm sorry, there's nothing I could do. There's nothing more I could do. And he's making both statements all at the same time with that statement. So what's the distinction between these two sicknesses that Jesus is addressing here? The first is that, or, or the, the distinction is sinners and the righteous, which is like confusing for a religious person. These, these identifying terms, like these are, in some ways I guess you could say these, these are trigger words, right? And you're, like you, like you, holy man, Jesus, you're saying that you're here not for the righteous, but sinners? Jesus is really screwing the system up here. And by considering like the patient history of the Pharisees, like what Jesus is really saying here isn't that like, hey, I, I want you to be good. That's not, he's saying that like your self-righteousness, I have nothing for that. I can do nothing with your self-righteousness. I can do nothing with your pride. There's no treatment in this case for this type of sickness. There's no treatment plan for self-righteousness. But what does Jesus have planned for the sinners? And specifically for the tax collectors in this case. What's, their tre what's Jesus' treatment plan for the tax collectors? Let's consider their patient history a little bit, okay? So if you've been in the church world a little bit, um, you probably would have heard a little thing or two about tax collectors. Like They're pretty much on the bottom ladder of the social tier of ancient Israel. They worked for the Roman Empire against their own people. They were tax collectors who hired themselves out to the Roman Empire for a specific amount of money that were required by law to collect, right? And so your employment contract with the empire forced you to collect enough revenue to pay Rome but also anything above and beyond that, you're able to keep for yourself. So it's a pretty sweet deal for the tax collectors. But it was a system that was like made perfect for like greed, corruption, oppression, which the tax collectors pretty much became to like came to personify. So they were judged harshly by the Jewish people. They were judged, judged very harshly by their own people. When a Jewish person became a tax collector for Rome, he immediately became a social outcast and was viewed as a traitor to the race and the nation. He was forever disqualified to serve as a judge or witness in court. He was excommunicated from the synagogue, and, and the disgrace that was for him also extended to his family. So, I mean, it's even telling. It's even telling that the biblical writers, the Bible writers themselves, would separate sinners and tax collectors. You know what I mean? Like, it's not just like, you can't just like lump the tax collectors with the sinners. It's like, oh, there's sinners and there's like tax collectors. It's like another bottom tier of like, 
This is your, this is your average Joe sinner. This is like the one that, you know, cusses every once in a while, maybe drinks a little bit too much. But then these are like the sinners. And the biblical writers are highlighting this context or this reality, this social dynamic. So with that in mind, for Jesus to invite Levi, to make a personal invite, two-word invite of follow me. That has like deep implications. That has deep implications. For Jesus and his disciples to be seen in public eating a meal with Levi and his tax collector friends, I mean, what's seen as like culturally, socially, religiously provocative. But for Jesus to be with them was to extend the very hand of God, the hand of fellowship, the hand of grace, the hand of acceptance and forgiveness and hope for restoration for, for the tax collector and his family and the community that once ostracized him. And all that was a part of the treatment plan, Jesus' treatment plan for Levi to restore what had been lost, both in his soul and for the community and the systems around him. But what's more incredibly like specific about Levi's restoration is this. That as a tax collector, this dude was educated. Like he was handy with a pen, you know what I mean? Like, like before following Jesus, Levi used a pen and a ledger to start keeping track record of Jesus' life. He kept a ledger, like, or he, he, he kept a ledger to like serve an earthly empire and to serve a spiritual empire of his own greed. But when he started following Jesus, he used a pen to, to start recording Jesus' life. He kept a ledger of what he taught, where he went, what he did, how he connected with people, how he talked to people, how, he, how and who he healed. He wrote about how Jesus lived and how he died and how he resurrected and then he ascended. He kept track of Jesus in every way. And he wrote it in a specific way that spoke to the Jewish people. He was dropping references and stamping old, I was going to say old school, Old Testament text. It is old school. Um, old Testament text that highlighted how Jesus was a prophesied Messiah. And when Levi's work was all put together, he signed it with his other name, Matthew. The disciple Levi in this text is the one that puts together the gospel of Matthew. And this is how Jesus doctors the sick. This is how Jesus heals. This is the type of restoration that this is the type of restoration that's Jesus' treatment plan for the sinner. And to be a sinner means that you are someone who is willing to repent and believe and follow Jesus, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago and last week too. But <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm reminded like a good, good wise friend and a pretty darn good pastor, Jay Lee, he, he, once, he once taught this, and it really stuck with me. He said that when Jesus heals a liar, he doesn't heal them so that they stop lying. He heals them so that they could be a truth teller. When Jesus heals a greedy person, he doesn't heal them so they just stop being greedy. He heals them to be generous. When Jesus heals... He doesn't heal just so that the hurt will go away. He heals so, so that there'll be a re restoration beyond the hurt. Because here's the truth, friends. The gospel is both about Jesus healing, what Jesus is healing us from and what Jesus is healing us into. Repentance. Repentance leads us to, is, 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 what, about, is what Jesus is healing us from. But the, but the journey of discipleship, walking with Jesus, being in a relationship with Jesus, that is about what Jesus is healing us into. And both are the gospel. The gospel is both about what Jesus is healing us from and what Jesus is healing us into. It's never just about stopping a sin. It's about restoring us to the Imago Dei. It's about restoring our shalom. Um, there's a story a, a, little, a little more recent than the story of Mark. Um, back in 2012, um, uh, you know, when like 
we thought the world, like the world was supposed to end in 2012, right? Um, but it kept going. And in, in that year, in that year, um, there was an 82-year-old woman. Uh, he's a painter from a real town in Borja, Spain. He attempted to restore a painting of Jesus uh, titled Eche Homo by Elias Garcia Martinez. And the results of her restoration went viral. Um, you may have seen this. Um, that's so. Yeah, that's that's what happened. <laughs> um, but here's the like truth be told, like the painting. So the the one on the left is a lot more like it's it's well more preserved. But there's a picture before the restoration, and you could tell like like the patches and there are like spots like missing and stuff. It was definitely like it needed re restoring. It was getting old. Um, but ironically, it's the very process of restoration where things got really messed up. And like, there's something about this restoration attempt that feels like very um, 2021 to me. Like, it's a meme, yes, it is a meme indeed. But it's also a metaphor. <laughs> um, it's it's a metaphor for what could have been. It's it's a metaphor for unmet expectations. It's it's a metaphor for feeling so broken beyond repair. It, it's a metaphor for even like how having the best intentions sometimes doesn't end up with the best results. It's a metaphor for how sometimes our intervention does more harm than good. Um, it's a metaphor for how much discrepancy there is between original design and to where things are at now. It's, it's a metaphor for the condition we find ourselves here now in 2021. And, um, and I know that sounds really bleak, <laughs> but I, I don't think I, I need to spend too much time trying to convince you that the world we find ourselves in now, today, could use some repair. And I, I think if some of us are willing to be honest with ourselves, it's the same for us, too. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we, could, we would say that our souls, um, in some way, shape, or form, could use some restoration and healing. You know, because isn't it true for some of us that like in our attempt to like make sense of the pandemic, like we, we've turned more inward toward ourselves, right? Instead of coming together, like we turned against each other. Not all of us, but there's people out there, right? Definitely not us, but there are people out there. Like instead of more empathy and compassion, we, we shaped our culture um, to be more weary and more or less trusting of each other. You know, in, in this time, I feel like for those of us who are prone to like fear and worry, like the pandemic highlighted that. For those of us who are prone to like self-righteousness and pride, the pandemic highlighted that. And I don't say that to like shame any one of us, but like it does highlight that what the Bible says about the human condition is true. That we do have a pre-existing condition of sin and all that COVID did was like, it was just a steroid for that sin. Human all of humanity was already sick before COVID. And last year, it just made us more aware of it. So, so much like this painting, we were already in need of repair. And for some of us, in the process of us trying to restore ourselves, from this pandemic, some of us, we find ourselves more messed up than we were, we were before. Sometimes sin works like that. Sin works like that within us. That's how messed up sin is. But, but here's a part of the good news. And this is why we're, we're going through the Gospel of Mark and trying to unpack what it means to be a disciple and follower of Jesus. Like, Jesus is so much for the sinner. 
Like he loves the sinner too much to leave us sick. And I feel like we're living in a time when we need Jesus' healing more than ever. Our our world, our, our nation, our culture, our society, even our religion is hurting. We are hemorrhaging and hurt. And when we humble ourselves and recognize our desperate need for healing in those spaces, it, it is then we realize that it is, it is for a time as such as this that Jesus came so we would have life, and life abundantly. You know, in our self-righteousness, in our Messiah complexness, because, you know, a lot of us in the church unknowingly, just, we just have that for some reason. It just kind of became an un unwelcome byproduct of growing up in the church. For some of us who grew up in the church, we have this Messiah complex. And I remember in the beginning of the pandemic, I remember they're like, they were like, and I, I mean, I was encouraged by this. <laughs> and and there's definitely truth to it. I don't want to like just kind of like wash it all away, but that we are here for a time as such as this. But the more and more I realize that it's not about what we can do in this time. It, it's more about what we need from Jesus in this time. It's about us accepting our sinful nature and saying, Jesus, we need you to heal us. Because there are aspects of ourselves that can only be healed and restored by Jesus. So going back to the Ece Homo painting, um, the story actually doesn't end there. Um, the, the late, she's a sweet old lady. If you see the interviews of her, she's like so sweet. Um, the, the town of Borja, Spain, it actually became a really popular tourist destination. Um, it, before the pandemic, it was attracting over 160,000 people a year. So it, it became like the whole economy now of this small Euro town in Spain was based around this botched painting of a potato Jesus, you know? And <laughs> and like, and it generated more jobs. Like there are restaurants, hotels, like uh, 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 museums that came out of it. Uh, I'm, some cool stories like this: the the church received a lot of the funding and donations from from people who visited, and they were able to start a nursing home where the painter lives at. Um, and not only that. The, the souvenirs, like the proceeds from the souvenirs of, like, there, there, there's wine bottles, by the way, with potato Jesus, or monkey Jesus is also known as. Uh, like, and there's all these souvenirs, perfect mugs, and all you know, the typical like, goods that you could get. The proceeds of that goes to the painter whose adult son has cerebral palsy. So like, this like, total like, laughing stock of event ended up blessing not only this woman, but her family, and her town, and like, I know that's not the perfect analogy, <laughs> but can we let that be a reminder of how, that's like, that's how Jesus heals. When Jesus heals us from something, he just doesn't heal, he just doesn't heal us so that it stops something. He heals us into something greater. Because the gospel isn't about what Jesus is healing us from, but it's about what, is he, what he is healing us into. And being faithful to that process of Jesus healing us, that in itself is discipleship. So here's what I want us to do to end our time together this morning. Um, I, we, don't, we don't usually do this, but we're going to spend some time um, praying and just kind of processing. Um, or, no, we're going to spend some time with the Holy Spirit. We're going to let him speak into us. We're going to let him um, to bring to surface this the spaces where we feel like we need healing. Maybe we could imagine ourselves going before the good doctor, the good physician, and Jesus saying, so what brings you in today? What's hurting you today? What traumas are you bringing in today? What fears, what worries, what anxieties are you bringing in today? What's been plaguing your mind? 
what sins have been a cancer to your soul? Bitterness, anger, apathy, lust, pride, judgment. What brings you in today? Let's, some, let's spend some time with Jehovah Rapha. Let's be our healer, God. And let's allow him to breathe into us for a little bit. So can we, let's spend a moment in silence.